Okay, today we're in the Gospel of John chapter 7. Last time we finished studying John 6. And so today we start the next chapter reading from the New King James Version in the Gospel of John chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples may also see the works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to the feast, for my time is not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, He's good. Others said, No, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? That was verse 15 we ended at. So let's look at this verse by verse and, and actually starting out phrase by phrase in this passage. Verse 1 says, After these things. Now, scholars that know a lot more about the timelines than I do feel like this chapter is, starts about a year after the events that we just studied in chapter 6 and about half a year before the crucifixion. And in fact, uh, there are many months that are covered in the phrase that says, Jesus walked in Galilee. It's a long period of time. Now, Galilee, as you recall, is in the northern part of Israel, around the Sea of Galilee, kind of mostly to the west, a little to the north. And it included towns like Capernaum, Bethsaida, Magdala, Tiberias, Cana, and uh, Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. Now, most of the gospel, most of the ministry in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John took place during this time frame and took place up in the Galilee area. If you want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus during his ministry, visit Israel and visit Galilee. You'll see, you'll walk exactly where he walked at. But then it says, for he did not want to walk in Judea. Now Judea was the southern part of Israel, mostly to the west of the Dead Sea and, and out to the Mediterranean, um, including the Gaza Strip that we hear so much about today that's occupied by a, a different people right now. Of course, Jerusalem was the most significant city, uh, but the region also had Hebron, Bethany, Emmaus, Jericho, and actually uh, the birthplace of Jesus, Bethlehem. Uh, now, between these two regions in Israel was Samaria, which was quite a large area that we detailed back when we studied chapter 4. So, I won't go over that again. But, why did Jesus not prefer to walk in Judea? Or to teach, to do his miracles, uh, to, to show people what the kingdom of God was like. Well, it says right here, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, when John says the Jews, we know he's not talking about the entire Israelites. Don't, don't get a negative picture of Jewish people because of what this says. Uh, it's understood when he writes this that he's talking about the Jewish political and religious leaders of that time. And we studied in chapter 5 that they wanted to kill Jesus after he healed a lame man on the Sabbath day in Jerusalem. <laughs> Sounds odd, but that's what happened. And, uh, you know, we can study through that. You can look back and study that out. But Jesus, in fact, references that in his teaching a little bit later on in this chapter. Now, that part we won't get to until next week, but it was, it was so mixed up. You know, they weren't welcoming and honoring this long-awaited Messiah that they had been looking forward to for so many years. Not at all. They were actually so, um, I guess, enthralled, is the word it would say, with, by the control they had over the people and the power they had over the people that they were supposed to be serving and teaching God's word, they were so, um, so drunk with that power that they actually sought to eliminate any competition 
And that competition with them included the very God that they claimed to serve. So that was kind of, uh, kind of misguided. So in chapter 6, we saw where folks had even sent representatives all the way from Jerusalem, all the way up to um, Capernaum. Jerusalem, again, was down in the south part of Israel, in Judea. They'd sent them all the way up the north part in, in Capernaum just to simply discredit Jesus' ministry and try to disrupt it all they could. So they were pretty upset at him. So Jesus was afraid that he would be killed, and so he was trying to avoid them, right? No. <laughs> That wasn't right. It wasn't the reason. Jesus had already been confronted quite a bit already. And not only he had addressed the true concerns they might have had, but Jesus also showed them an incredible tolerance and love and compassion for any of them that were willing to repent of their wrongdoing, their bad attitudes and their, their evil, and to follow him. In addition, when they were unrepentant, Jesus didn't hesitate to follow up with pointing out their hypocrisy. And, and their inconsistencies. So, I mean, he, he, he hit them head on. And when they, would, um, when they would question him and think they would have him at some point, instead of backing up or backing off, he would actually go stronger into uh, teaching them what God had for them and what was right. And so there wasn't really a, a fear factor in Jesus not wanting to die at this point. So what was going on? Well, we find that Jesus was focused. Instead of being fearful, he was focused. He was focused on getting his work done before his time was over. He was focused on showing and teaching people how the kingdom of God works, focusing on bringing souls that were lost the good news of Jesus, the good news and, and showing miracles uh, of love and compassion to show them that God really does want them to... Uh, to have a better life, that he really has power that, uh, that can be beneficial for them. So he was focused on bringing eternal life. We talked last week, over and over, he talked about eternal life, about life that God wanted people to have that lasted forever. So in John, there's a, um, there a kind of a gap. There was a lot of ministry that Jesus did that was not recorded in the Gospel of John. In fact, um, we just studied the two days of ministry happening in John chapter 6 and uh, part of chapter 5. But during that time, those two days um, of, of space in the Gospels, Matthew records all of chapters 12 through 18. Mark records chapters 3 through 9. Luke, chapter 6 through 9. And if you're looking for a chronological study, uh, slow those words down and, and read all of those. Uh, but that was about two years worth of ministry in, in those times. So the pace soon will change, though, as John slows down now and he records many details of the last months of Jesus' ministry that the other Gospels don't record. But let's take a look at um, a life lesson for us here following Jesus. Our life lesson is don't be fearful. Be focused on spreading the good news. Don't be fearful be focused on spreading the good news. Again, verse 1, all together, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Again, he wasn't afraid of the ruling authorities killed him. He talked many times of his willingness to give his life, his flesh, his blood, and of his death that was coming up. But the timing had to be right. That was the important thing. There was a specific day that Jesus would die. It was predicted by the prophets hundreds of years earlier. God was in control, and Jesus was not about to let mere men mess with the timing that God had in his plans. So we see Jesus being wise to avoid not only things that would be distracting from his work, because he knew also in Judea there would be a lot of distractions with more of the rulers there trying to disrupt his ministry. <clears throat> but he was also keeping him from being uh, keeping himself from being prematurely killed. Now, here's another life lesson for us, and that is be wise. Avoid situations where you could be killed. Okay? Be wise. Avoid situations where you could be killed. Now, verse 2. Now, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles, 
no, Feast of Tabernacles, also called the Feast of Booths, was one of the seven feasts of the Lord throughout the year that had been gifted. There were actually gifts to the Hebrew people uh, back in Leviticus chapter 23. That's a great homework assignment for you. Read Leviticus 23 and see all the things that God said, observe these things as my people. And it was teaching them uh, how he's in control of the seasons and, and the times. Um, and that, that kind of ties in with Jesus' timing here of, you know, it's not yet my time. So um, the, these uh, feasts, these seven feasts of the Lord, uh, now the Jews had a few more feasts in there, but these are the seven feasts of the Lord that uh, picture the events leading from Jesus' death and sacrifice for our sins, symbolized the Passover, through the second coming and establishment of Jesus' eternal and final kingdom. Um, and these are the feasts of the year that God commanded the children to observe. Now, please understand that the church, as Christians, we're not, if you're not a Jewish person, if you're not a Hebrew person, uh, you're not under legal obligations to observe the feasts and festivals. And if you have doubts about that, you can read Galatians 4 and 5 and honestly read them over and over again until you understand the freedom that God has given us. Now that said, we can learn a lot uh, for, through studying these things uh, as non-Israelites, as we study God's timelines. And um, also you can, you are able to, you know, if there's, no for, there's no forbidding of us to celebrate these festivals. I've, I've celebrated several of these and it's just a blessing to see how all of these things that, that Jews to this day celebrate all point to Jesus Christ and the prophetic timeline. So you can study them for days, for a few hours or weeks or years. Some people have studied them for years. But I'm gonna just go over a very short flyover just to give you an idea of what these are. And the dates during the year are different because they, are, they do go by the, the Hebrew calendar which is based on a lunar cycle. And so our, our calendar, the Gregorian calendar we use just doesn't match up. So, so I'll, just, I'll just leave it with um, spring and fall mostly. So the spring feasts, which have already been fulfilled, was the Lord's Passover, that pointed to Jesus' death, the spotless Lamb of God to give us eternal life. There's the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, that's pointing to the burial of Jesus and the burial of our sins with him. Then there's the First Fruits, which points to the resurrection of Jesus and the ascent, his ascension to the Father, which will happen to all believers who will ascend. Then there's a, a small, short time gap before the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost. Pentecost meaning 50 days after the Passover. And that pointed to the birth of the church 50 days later. Now, then there's the summer. It's a long summer sometimes, <laughs> especially if you're out here and the air conditioning fails, right? Uh, the church, this corresponds to the church age. It's a long period of time from Jesus' sacrifice and the birth of the church until the fall feasts are fulfilled. Now, these are, are varying, and different people have different takes on exactly what each one means. But we know those, those first four I just mentioned have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. These other three have yet to be fulfilled. The Feast of Trumpets. Can you guess what that means? Yes, there's a time when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound to warn people, prepare to meet God, and all those who are in Christ will rise, ascend, and be gathered to be with the Lord. Then there's the Day of Atonement. For, for the Israel, it's a national day of forgiveness. And in, in the future, it points to the time of trouble and tribulation uh, with Israel's, since Israel generally rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah. And it allows a final opportunity for them to recognize him as the promised one who died for their sins and to understand the kingdom. And then there's the Feast of Tabernacles, which was what Jesus was attending. Now this was a joyful time. It was commemorating the gathering in of the harvest, all the things God had blessed the people with and it parallels the time when Jesus will set up his eternal kingdom to reign and and the joy the Bible says the joy of the Lord fills the entire earth so I know that's a lot took a few moments to go over that but um, even when you're flying over it it's a great study when you have time to investigate some really cool things about uh, these prophecies are the Jewish people still observe today so Feast of Tabernacle Feast of Booths same thing the men in each family were obligated to attend this in Jerusalem every year. They came and they set up Feast of Booths. They set up booths or tents. There were specific uh, ways they were supposed to set them up. Uh, you know, today we'd probably set up RVs and campers. <laughs> so we could have one right here at the, at the campground. But 
Um, it would, you know, we could have an RV as a festival to the Lord. It's a joyful town uh, time. They had trumpets. They had um, lots of food. Uh, the priests would pour out water and wine all over the altars. They'd sing psalms, uh, specific psalms in the scriptures. And uh, we'll see some, some more of the significance of that later on in this chapter. But it was a great time. Lots of people were there. And that gives us a life lesson. God loves to see his people have a good time celebrating the things that he provides for us. God loves to see his people having a good time, celebrating good things that he provides for us. Now, in this passage, we see that Jesus' own immediately family, own immediate family was getting involved, and they were encouraging him, encouraging him to go. Verse 3, his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the work you're doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for even his brothers didn't believe in him. Now, to me, this seemed pretty odd to start with. Uh, his brothers, we know his physical, biological brothers, sons of Mary, James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude, some of the names varied a little bit, but they, they were, they, they knew Jesus was a great guy. I mean, he'd never done anything wrong. Uh, he'd never lied about him. He'd never lied to them. Anybody, you got a big brother? And, the, and you could say he's never done anything bad to you? <laughs> okay, that just doesn't happen. So he, he was never mean to his, his brothers and sisters. He honored his parents. In short, he was the best big brother that anyone could ever have. Okay, they knew he was going around. They saw the miracles that he was doing. They, they knew that was genuine but they didn't yet believe that he was divine. I mean, he was their brother. I mean, how many of y'all would look at your little brother or big brother and say, oh yeah, he's God. You know, he, they didn't get it at that point. And, you know, we see Mary, we, when, when Mary was given the revelation that she would bear God's own son, uh, it said she pondered these things in her heart. It doesn't say she went and blabbed to everybody. <laughs> she didn't tell everybody, oh, this is God. She, God allowed her to hold that in and allow Jesus' works and his words to, to make that evident to people. And that's the way it is today too, isn't it? God's word reveals his divinity to us. If someone says, I don't believe the Bible, I don't believe that God, Jesus is God's son, what's the best way to convince them? Let them hear the word of God. And that's what Mary did as well. So even his brothers didn't believe in him, but they did see that he was a good guy and that the ruling people were constantly against him. And so they saw this would be a great time for him to go right in the middle of one of the busiest weeks of the year, show everybody the wonderful works that he did. And, you know, they were even prodding him with his own teaching, you know, saying, don't hide your light, shine it brightly on a hill for everybody to see. You know, so they were, they thought they were encouraging him in that way. Um, they, they, they kind of talked like the disciples that were down in Judea really needed to even see more of these miracles and would, their faith would grow. And so they thought they were doing a good thing. And, and I get the, the feeling like some of the other followers that we've read about and studied about, that they thought he would make a great king. I, especially if my big brother's king, guess what? I'm going to get a pretty good spot in the kingdom too. And he would help get rid of the oppressive uh, leaders of their time. But they still did not understand the real kingdom of God. Now, fortunately, or blessedly, we do know his brothers did come to believe in him after the resurrection and ascension. They were having a prayer meeting. The disciples, the true believers in Jesus, in Acts 1, 13 to 14, um, it says, when they entered, they went up into the upper room when they were, where they were staying. It named the remaining 11 apostles. And then it says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now his brothers were old enough at this point they could be out doing whatever they wanted to. They came to the prayer meeting with the disciples. They were believers in Jesus by this time. They knew suddenly after the resurrection and the ascension, they knew this was not just an ordinary big brother. In fact, James, uh, whose name is actually uh, Jacob, uh, or Jacob as we call it in English, but in, in uh, our scriptures it usually says James, uh, you'll recognize that book in the New Testament. You'll also recognize Jude, J-U-D-E, also sometimes called Judas. 
not, not Iscariot, but that was a common name. You recognize those as writers in the New Testament. Now, um, both of them, it was interesting, both of them regarded being a servant of the Lord, serving the Lord as being a higher calling with more authority than being a brother to the Lord Jesus. As both of them, as they open up their, their uh, letters, they say, they identify themselves and say, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than a biological brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. So his brothers were telling him at this point, before they came and, and recognized his divinity, they told him, go out, be open, show everyone the great things you're doing, let them see what a great leader you're gonna be. And uh, they were just taking it for, taking for advantage, taking for granted that he, wanted, he just wanted a bigger audience and needed more people to follow him. So in verse six, Jesus come back, says to them, then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. And when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Again, his brothers had it all planned out. Jesus was rejecting. He just flat out rejected their wonderful advice. Uh, they thought they knew what was best, but with a few words, he rejected. You know, sometimes, I know it never happens to you, but to me, I've got plans, you know. And Jesus used just a few words. He's like, nope, not going to happen. Um, you know, I love them. They loved them, but... So, you know, obviously this has no present day application to any of us, so let's move along. <laughs> no, it, of course it does. How many times have you had a plan? A really good plan, a great plan, in fact, and you told the Lord that he needed to work things out for you, and here's his plan for you. You gave it to him, but it wasn't going to happen. Maybe I should ask how many times this week or how many times today <laughs> that that's happened to you. Well, maybe we can learn a few things uh, by looking at some of the possible issues with their plans. And by extension with our plans. Um, the brothers' plans were a little presumptuous. They were signaling, signaling, they were saying that they probably knew a little better of how to make this plan of action work for them than Jesus did. Now, that was a problem. Uh, another thing, they were pretty loose with security pre precautions. Everybody knew that, that the leaders wanted to kill Jesus in, in uh, Judea. And so, you know, their, their hopes of him becoming a great leader were not um, tempered with the idea that don't get this guy killed. So another thing is, uh, you know, some, somebody suggested maybe they were tired of him being the center of things and hope he'd stay down in Judah while they were up in Galilee. And I'm not sure that was, that was not quite the thing. Um, there's also an insinuation that maybe the disciples down in Judea were a little weak and they needed more strengthening. They wanted to, they needed to see more miracles. But as we studied before, um, it wasn't the miracles of Jesus that caused people to believe in him. It, it brought attention, but it was his words that brought people to Jesus. Um, could it be they simply thought that Jesus was kind of just like them? Just another man seeking the approval and you know, more likes and loves on their Facebook and on his Facebook posts, just like we do. Um, they also believe that Jesus' success depended on what the world thought about him, what the people thought about him, rather than his obedience to what the Father had for him. So they didn't understand these things. We can understand, looking back, we can understand and learn from them. Now, finally, it may have been that he, they knew he would be well received and uh, yeah, it would give them a lot of brownie points for them being with him as, they, as he was doing all these miracles. Oh, yeah, I'm his brother. Yep, that's me. That's, that's my big brother. You know? Oh, wow. Wow, it must be something great being a, big, being a little brother to him. So, you know, we, we look at these and it's so convicting to me at least that um, these are many of the things that I seek when I plan out things for God to do. And yet... The scripture doesn't promise us, and I don't think it's meant to be, that God honors the plans that we design for him to do. Um, you know, don't go to church just to make a good appearance. I know that's, that's probably not an issue here at, uh, at Forest Lake. But uh, I know sometimes people, uh, I've heard people, are you going to church? Well, if you'll go, I go I'll go. Well, why? Well, if you don't go, then I'm not going to go. 
Why is that? Well, if you go with a friend, at least there'll be one other person that says, oh, they're a good person, they're going. <laughs> so anyway, before it gets con too convicting, let me just hit another life lesson. And that is look to Jesus to guide you in all your plans. Don't depend on your own wisdom, but take advantage of his. Those that are writing, write fast. Look to Jesus to guide you in all your plans. Don't depend on your own wisdom, but take advantage of his. Now, as we take a closer look at how Jesus, re in his rejection of his brother's plans, it might sound a little familiar to us, those of us who have been in this study for a few months. Verse 6, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it. Its works are evil. You go up to this feast, <clears throat> and I'm not going up, I'm not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Jesus has talked about this before. He's talked about it again. The wedding in Cana, he told his mother, my hour has not yet come. Here he's being even more specific. Um, sometimes I, I, I kind of dig in. I don't, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I, I check. I dig in and find out, okay, what is the word he's actually using for time here? And this is uh, kairos, which is often translated in other areas and other places as an opportunity or season. That it's the best time for something to be done. So if I plug that concept into these verses, we'll get an even better idea of what Jesus is saying. He's saying, my opportunity has not yet come, but your season is always ready. And in verse 8, you go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to the feast, for my season has not fully come. Now, God's timing involves not only good opportunities, but the best opportunity, the best season. In obedience to his father, Jesus lived out the tr truth that God, God's will has a very important and integral part and that is his timing. In other words, there are things that are definitely in God's will, but it's not always the right timing for that will to be carried out. There is a specific time to which each part of Jesus' ministry was progressing. There was a specific time when he would give his life as a sacrifice. We saw there was a specific time when he would show signs that he could perform miraculous works. And there's specific times that he was to, to pull back and not go into certain areas and a specific time that his life-giving power would be revealed, as we saw in the resurrection. So a life lesson for us today is, trust God to work his will in your life, but also trust his timing as to when his will, when he will do that work. Try again. Trust God to work his will in your life, but also trust his timing as to when he will do that work. And one more thing I'll mention about verse 7. It says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Now, Jesus was telling his unbelieving brother that they'll be safe around the feast. His enemies aren't going to bother them because they're still part of the world. They don't believe in him. They're not proclaiming that Jesus is divine, Jesus is God, and that there's a kingdom of God coming. This, so even though they probably wanted to see him be a king and ruler, he was still part of the part of they, they were still part of the world. He's telling them the world cannot be expected to be a threat to them since they're part of it. Now, for us, I don't want that to happen. I don't want something, I don't want the enemy of God, the enemies of God to say, Bob's not a threat. I don't want him to be to say I'm a threat. You know, if you're doing something for God, you're gonna have a target on your back. When you step out in ministry, if you step out in uh, even step out and telling someone about Jesus or doing something that you feel that, that God is leading you to do, you're going to find out that something's going to hit you. And it's not going to be God saying, no, 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 that's not right. It's going to be the enemy trying to pull you down, trying to distract you from the job. And you don't want to be a part of that. So a life lesson for us here is be a threat to the evil system of the world. Follow Jesus. Okay. Be a threat to the evil system of the world. Follow Jesus. So let's move on and find out what happens next. In verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast. Not openly, but as it were in secret. It's almost weird. 
So I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version, and it gives a better idea of how he was traveling and uh, a little more meaning to the words. In verse 10, But afterward, when his brothers had gone up to the feast, he went up also, not publicly, not with the caravan, but by himself quietly, as if he did not wish to be observed. Okay? He wasn't hiding. He wasn't, you know... <laughs> He wasn't being clandestine. He just was not drawing publicity to himself and being in the big crowd that was coming. And uh, it wasn't time. Now we do see months later, as the crowds welcomed him into Jerusalem, that it was time for a big crowd to be around him saying, here's the king. But it wasn't at this time. Now sometimes you want to tell the whole world about things that are going on in ministry and something's going on. And sometimes it's not best to do so. So we know Jesus wasn't being deceptive traveling. He was simply avoiding unwelcome publicity that could cause some problems. And uh, that's what we're seeing. And then this part of, of Israel, Judea, another, another factor is the Jews, uh, the, the leaders there often looked down on those people that were up in, up in uh, Galilee. Um, there were, they, they generally followed the Lord tried to follow the Lord closer, it seems, in, the, in Judea than they did in the other parts of, of Israel. <clears throat> and much like we, we saw that Nathaniel kind of looked down on people from Nazareth, uh, the big shots in Jerusalem were kind of quick to dismiss Jesus as being from the wrong part of Israel. And so it's like, oh yeah, yeah he's, he's from Galilee? Yeah, nothing comes out of Galilee. Yeah, that can't, that can't be the Messiah. So uh, when they saw... It was interesting, though, when they saw the rest of his family there. And I, I find it interesting that they did recognize his brothers and his mother, and the rest of his family. I mean, it wasn't like there was only 50 or 60 people. I mean, there were thousands, tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of people pouring into, to, into Jerusalem. And yet the religious leaders, the, the leaders there, noticed these four brothers. <laughs> noticed, oh, this is, these are Jesus' brothers. And so they, they sought him, him and said, hey, where is he? Where is he? Where's Jesus? So the question came up in my mind. Were they expecting Jesus to show up in a big way? Kind of like his brothers had asked for him to do? You know, it was widely believed that the Messiah was going to come and be known in a spectacular way. And what better place to do it? than in a huge crowd of people at the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus had been doing miracles, ministering, teaching, healing uh, all over the place. But as we've seen time and time again, it wasn't a showy thing that Jesus was doing. It was, a love, it was love and compassion that he, was, he had on people, their situations. He didn't heal people because, he's, you know, because he wanted to gather a big tent and, you know, and raise a lot of money. He was healing people because he felt bad because they had, they had diseases. They had been lame. You know, they, they had a demon inside them. It's like, got to get this out. We've got to make this person whole. You know, that, that's his love and compassion. And so I, I wondered if these leaders at this time were really, really did deep down believe that this is most likely the Messiah and he's probably going to show up here and do something big and, and hoping, he, you know, deep down hoping he'd set the kingdom up. So I think a lot of them were conflicted. And, and as we read, can, as we continue in the New Testament further on, we do see, now obviously, that the church started with Jewish people. It started with many, uh, many of the leaders that had rejected or that had been in the crowd that rejected Jesus. Many of them came to faith in Jesus, and that's where the church began. And it was only later that the, the non-Jews, the Gentiles, uh, became a part of it. So... Let's remember on, on this timing, though, they were, hope, you know, they were thinking he may come and do a big thing, but God was in control. It wasn't the people. And in verse 12, we see something going on in the people. It says, there, were, there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he was good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. You know, some things never change. This could be an account from today. You know, go on the street. What do you think about Jesus? Oh, he's good. Oh, he's great. <laughs> he was just a liar. <laughs> you know, he, was, he, was, he thought he was crazy, man. He thought he was God. You, know, you get all kinds of things. But people are all divided on what, who Jesus is. Many have heard about him. Some of them then as now 
they, they knew just enough to decide to avoid him and hope things will work out okay. Uh, but once people hear him, once you hear the words of God, there's not a middle ground. You can reject him as deceiver or you can accept him as good. The only one that is good and that is God. I suspect that the hardcore opponents of Jesus here, <clears throat> the ones that were going around saying, oh, he's deceiving the people. These were probably the main ones that were, um, that were already trying to get people, dissuade people from following Jesus. Um, the common people really wanted the Messiah to come. Uh, they really wanted someone to deliver them. And, and still today, as there are leaders who love their own power and control more than they love the truth, they instill fear in people. They don't want common people to speak openly about Jesus and the truths that he brings. Now, the leaders in our text today knew they couldn't honestly bring up charges against Jesus. They couldn't win an honest debate uh, speaking truth. They couldn't even dispute the words. They couldn't even take down what he had said. When they tried to crucify him later on and tried to get a trial against him, you know, they would quote him and they couldn't even get their act together to, to, to twist his words. And it wasn't until Jesus came himself in person and they asked, you know, are, are you? <laughs> are you the son of God? And he said, you're saying the words, you know, you're saying it right. Basically, he, was, he told them. And at that point, oh, now he's being deceptive. You know, now he's, now he's guilty. Well, yes, he was guilty of being divine. But he wasn't guilty of a crime. But anyway, um, th these leaders could not you know, they couldn't honestly come against him, and especially with a large crowd, with his words, his actions, all being so perfect. I mean, he was perfect. Uh, all they could do is forbid people to talk about him. Don't talk about Jesus. And so we see that happening here. Now, I know my time is, is pretty much gone, but I do want to touch on the next couple of verses real quick. And, and I find that they're both astonishing and odd, and I kind of think they're a little funny. And that's verse 14 and 15. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to wrap it up but, and not dig in, but I mean, these people didn't even want to be... Jesus to talk about Jesus during the feast and all of a sudden in the middle of it he shows up where in the temple teaching people the teachers were not there teaching people things of God Jesus showed up and started teaching people things of God and the leaders there they, they without even thinking I believe uh, they, they said how does this guy know all these things we've never taught him all these things in fact we don't even know half this stuff and so I just, I just thought that was uh, kind of funny and, and very revealing that uh, their, their reaction to Jesus' teaching was, uh, was so honest at this point, but then we'll see, the, oh, they, they rein it back in. Oh, hold it, we're supposed to be against him. We're not supposed to be, <laughs> we're not supposed to be accepting his teaching. And so we'll, we'll jump into more of that next week. But um, I do encourage you, keep studying God's word. Um, you know, if you, if you haven't made a decision to know, to, to solidify Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please do that today, no matter how you get discouraged. If you know others that, uh, if, if you have accepted the Lord and you know others that are, um, that are discouraged or not sure what to think about Jesus, encourage them. Encourage them. And share God's word with others. Help make an eternal difference in their lives. Um, it's been good to be here with you today. As we close. Uh, before Brother Mike sings, uh, I'd like to pray a blessing over you. This is from God's Word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here.